Now we have more interviews from the ground at Sundance. Welcome back, Indie Angle, Utah. Did you know what you were making day one? Well, we knew we were making a movie about product placement marketing and advertising that was going to be paid for by product placement and advertising. Now, where it goes from there, who knows? We were going to be making a film that kind of, you know, pulled the curtain back on the whole idea of marketing, product placement, and advertising. Um, and I think they were willing to, to take part. I think they were scared. It was like they were at the premiere on Saturday, and um, Amy, who is the, the Amy of Amy's Frozen Pizza, was saying, uh, you know, we thought maybe he'd throw us under the bus. We didn't know what was going to happen, and, you know, it came out great. In this movie, we've turned that idea of selling out into a positive, which is it, which also is a, is a real, I think, natural comment on where we are today. I think a lot of people look at being able to sell out as a level of success. No advertisers will work with us. That was the thing. Not one advertising agency, with the exception of Richard Kirschbaum, who we went back to everyone said no, said yes. You know, like literally everyone else was out. You know, like all those, all those angry people wanted nothing to do with this because God forbid we ruined their core business. Uh, you know, convincing these brands that they need them. And I think that we had some brands that were incredibly smart and brave to kind of be in the movie. They were uh, very, uh, very trusting to kind of turn it over to us. And, uh, and I think it came out really cool. And that's why I said I think that's what makes those brands look brilliant. And, and the best part is, is as a result of that, that, that both screenings on Saturday night and the one that we had yesterday, both times, both screenings, people and so many in the audience said, I kind of want to go out and buy these products now. And so does product placement work? Absolutely it does. Have you been sued yet? No. Do you get sued often? Um, we got sued by a couple people in over Super Size Me, uh -huh. which were quickly dismissed. Uh -huh. um, but uh, yeah. So no. you got a good lawyer. Now we got a, a, a gaggle of great lawyers. <laughs> yeah. I mean, getting into Sundance, you know, the best thing is, uh, you know, just do everything you can to make sure you have a great story and, mm -hmm. and, and your movie is, you know, as complete as it can be. Don't send anything to Sundance until it's done, even if you're waiting another year. Because I've seen people who've sent like rough cuts that weren't ready, and already the the the, the, the programmers like saw early rough cuts, and so there was already a negative impulse to that film, even though the film came out great. Um, so for me, I think that that's the first thing. And then once you're in, and once you're here, um, you're going to be nervous, you're going to be scared, you're going to be freaking out. Um, even before my premiere the other day, and this is my third time here with a movie, like I slept an hour the night before the premiere. Like the next day, I was so nervous. Like I literally, I went to the gym and I worked out for an hour just to like get rid of any type of tension I had, and it made my whole day. So maybe, maybe, maybe you should go for a run, go for a walk, go skiing or something before your screening. Just like get out any bit of stress you have, yeah, um, and relax. Like, Does do it ever get any easier for you? I, you know, I think it's uh, you know it's get, it's easier to make films. Like it's become a lot easier for me to make them, but it's still it doesn't get easier to like relieve the the impact of what you think an audience is going to be. Because ultimately, you don't make a, a movie to put on a shelf. You make movies to, to share and, and you know share you share a part of yourself it is a child like literally I spent two years birthing the greatest baby uh, you know that we just had out here and uh, and God forbid somebody sits in a theater and then tears it apart in two hours you know what you want is uh, is hopefully that the work you put into it is, uh, is somehow you know embraced do you have any for, uh, just a tip for filmmakers in general going out there how to actually get started if they haven't done it I think the biggest thing is um, if you haven't started if, you, if you're scared and haven't gotten started what are you doing? You know, get a camera, get a computer. It's the easiest thing in the world to make a movie now. Like the the level of entry is so cheap. Like literally for five thousand dollars, you can buy a camera and a computer, and you can make a movie tomorrow. Um, and if you don't have five thousand dollars, I bet you know someone with a camera and a computer that you can rope in. Like Super Size Me, nobody got paid. We had at one point about forty five people working on that movie for nothing. Like people will give you their time, they will give you their trust, they will give you their faith if they know it's going to get finished. So the the biggest thing I tell all filmmakers is if you start a movie, finish it. Don't give up. Don't stop. Get it done. See it through. Even if, you know, you're not happy with it and people don't like it, that, that completion process is going to help you move on to the next thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Is it nice now that you get to pay everybody and that you actually do have kind of a They, appre they appreciate they it. They appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sundance is the most creative place you'll ever be. But speaking of creative peak ball, you sat down with, uh... Yes, I recently sat down with Shlomi Eldar to talk about his documentary, Precious Life, which actually won an Israeli Academy Award last year. And isn't it at Sundance now? It is. It is premiering at Sundance right now, and actually they're hoping to score a nomination this year. It'll be Israel's fourth year in a row getting a nod. Do you know 
יש לו בעיה מאוד קשה במערכת החיסון. I know that you're primarily um, a journalist. Did this start out as an idea for a piece, or was your intention all along to turn this into a film? I'm covering Gaza Strait uh, since 1990. Okay. I said 20 years, and what I've seen in Gaza Strait all the time is a war, bloodshed. A bit uh, part time of um, Oslo Agreement, it is, there was hope that uh, maybe it will be peace in the Middle East. But uh, most of the time, I'm a war correspondent, unfortunately. And I, um, I think that during the filming, when I saw that uh, as a journalist, I have to leave, to, to leave the journalism for a while and making part of the team that's saving the Palestinian baby, I had to do it because it was so simple for me. It's just a phone call, just making any connection, to move any connection and to, to save the baby's Palestinian life. As an Israeli, was it difficult for you to maintain a you know, diplomatic rapport with Raida specifically mm -hmm. um, to remain an unbiased director. When after uh, the Israeli, Israeli doctor, all the team saved Muhammad's life, and she started to speak uh, about uh, maybe she will send him to be a suicide bomber. And it was a dramatic, during the film, and a dramatic moment for me. It's confused me, it's depressed me. After this conversation, I decided to stop the film. The film. Because I said to myself, who would care about this film about saving Palestinian baby in Israeli hospital and sending him back to be a suicide bomber? Where, where the story? Why, why to document this kind of fighting to save the baby? Maybe it was her conception. Maybe it was she was afraid that when she returned back to Gaza, they would blame her. She would betray. But maybe. She tried to convince herself that she's still one of them. She didn't betray. She didn't cooperate with the Israelis. And I think this is the whole story. But I think what I can see in the film, and I hope that the, all the audience will see, the hope. The hope that we can do something for another future. Is there any tidbit of information you think that you would like to share? Any suggestions you'd like to make to people, aspiring filmmakers? Believe your story. That was a great interview. Hopefully he snags the nomination this year, fourth year in a row for Israel, so keep your fingers crossed. Well, that brings us to our picks of the week, and I have to say, based on that interview and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I'm gonna go ahead and say you should definitely go out and rent Ajami. It's a really difficult film to watch. It was done by a Palestinian and an Israeli filmmaker working together to do one narrative film. It's beautiful, it's brutal, and I think it's a definite must-see. Since we're high-fiving Israel, I'm gonna go ahead and suggest Walter Bashir, which was nominated for mm. Best Foreign Film two years ago. Yeah, that's great. Didn't it win? Really good. It, it didn't win. It should have, because in my brain I don't it think won. It did. In my brain it, it did, because it did deserve to. Real good. Check it out. Well, next week we've got more Oscar buzz and we have interviews with some of the nominees. Our tip of the week this week comes from 127 Hours director Danny Boyle. Academy Award winner. <laughs> for a 30 second tip for young independent filmmakers who are just starting out. I can do it much shorter than that. Uh, two things, only two things really. Work in, a, work, in, work in team, work in a team, you know, teamwork. Two minds are better than one. Yeah, three minds are even better than two, four minds, <laughs> etc. And be bold only.
listen to the interview derailer. You like, are a derailer. What else am I supposed to do? <laughs> no, it's hilarious. I'm gonna derail it. Um, I'm not gonna sit here and be all like serious. Well, now that you've gotten <laughs> talked to me before, you I are can. an indie darling. 